We all have something that we're better at than most. As a middle schooler or high schooler, you've started to uncover what that is. Maybe you thrive at sports, or you excel more than your classmates. Maybe you're super talented at painting or drawing or digital art, and often people comment on how amazing you are. Maybe your talents extend to video games or board games. Maybe it's taking you a little while to figure out what that is, but there is something about being recognized for your work. Being acknowledged for winning feels really good. And to be clear, I'm talking about winning where there was no chance at all that the opponent had any chance of winning. A an overwhelming victory. The kind where you walk away feeling like you can go lift a car over your head, toss it into the next state if you wanted to. But the reality is life isn't full of winning all the time. Even when we try our hardest and we push ourselves, we can find ourselves coming up short or having our fair share of failures. And those moments can be devastating and discouraging. Maybe it felt like that for you so often that you feel like it's just normal. Well, here's the deal. We all face battles every single day. Little battles, big battles, we're presented with battles daily that come to decide what type of life we want to live, what type of person we want to be, and how we want people to see us and talk about us. The reality is one of the hardest battles that people face is the battle of temptation. Temptation comes in all shapes and sizes, and unfortunately, it usually gets in the way of something that we want to achieve. Now, I want to be clear about something this morning. Temptation itself is not sin. When we are tempted to do something, we know we shouldn't do it. That isn't a moral, moral failure. It's when we give in to that temptation, when we follow through on that thing that we know we shouldn't do. We all face temptation in all sorts of ways. But that doesn't mean that we can't find victory. In fact, we can find overwhelming victory. Throughout this series, we're going to be looking at and memorizing this Bible verse from Romans 8, 37. To give you a little bit of context, this letter was written by Paul, one of the core writers of the New Testament, and it is written to the church in Rome, which is why it's called Romans. And in it, Paul has for the first five or six chapters expressed how unfortunately broken the world is as a result of sin. He talks about how all have fallen short of God's standard and should be responsible for their actions. But then we get to Romans 8. I can only imagine the Church of Rome reading up to this point and being like, oh, wow, Paul, <laughs> that's a lot of bad news. Are you okay? Are we okay? But then comes Romans 8, and he talks about freedom from condemnation, life in the Spirit, hope for the future. And then verse 35 is where we're going to pick up today. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Romans 8, 35 through 37. I want to go over that last part one more time. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Overwhelming victory. It's absolute. It's definitive. It's amazing. When it comes to the temptations that we face, we can stand firmly behind this statement. Jesus gives me overwhelming victory over temptation. But even as that statement suggests, there are some choices that we need to, need to make on how we respond to temptation, because ultimately it is still a choice. But we do have the power to have overwhelming victory over all these things in our lives. 
As we look at two choices we can make in responding to temptation and challenges in our life, we are going to look at Jesus and his life here on earth and some very real temptations that he faced, and we're going to see how he responded to that temptation. As Jesus had begun his ministry, he embarked on a journey into the wilderness. He spent 40 days fasting and wandering in the wilderness. If you're familiar with your Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, you might remember that Moses experienced something similar and that the Israelites themselves wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Both were times of testing for God's people, a time that they were expected to respond in obedience and in reliance on God. Jesus' time in the wilderness is like that, a great amount of time that he needed to be reliant on God. Remember that while Jesus is God, he was also fully human, and it is that humanity that is being tested at this time. Because guess who shows up to tempt him? The devil himself. This moment should be super important to us because it's a moment where Jesus shows us how we are to respond to temptation. There are two chief ways that the devil tempts Jesus, and they both really play into the fact that he is human. The first comes on the heel of his surviving in the wilderness. Naturally, after 40 days of not eating, we'd all be pretty hungry. So Jesus is really hungry here in this moment. And this is what we read in the text. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 3-4 through We could easily miss something here. Jesus quotes scripture. He says, No, no, no. The scripture says what's more important. And he's quoting from the writings that surrounded the Israelites and their time in the desert. Remember that connection we talked about? Jesus understands exactly what is happening in this moment. So, what is the devil tempting him with? He's tempting him with something physical, food, something that meets a need that he has right in that moment, an immediate need for food. But Jesus chooses to be reliant on God and on God's way and to obey what God had asked him to do. To live in that victory, there are choices. That brings us to the first choice we need to make when we're faced with temptations. So number one, I want you to remember to choose God's way, not shortcuts. We are all faced with moments where we can make a choice, where taking a shortcut when it comes to our physical or emotional needs ultimately opposes God's way and plan for our lives. The truth is that a lot of what we know about God and his way stands in the face of what the world believes and assumes is the way to live. When it comes to relationships, there's a belief that sexual activity is a shortcut to relational intimacy, but it's not. When it comes to personal gratification and satisfaction in life, there's a belief that certain substances makes things easier or more pleasant drugs, alcohol, you name it, but they don't. In fact, those often cause more harm than good in the long term. We have a hard time listening to our parents. We think that we often know what is best and listening and obeying to their rules and standards for our lives sometimes feels like a choice that goes against our personal freedoms or what we think is best. But often that's not the case. Instead, it's about our safety and well-being. My three-year-old really thinks that he knows what's best. He loves to run and growl like a dinosaur. When we're at the park or in a giant open field, that's awesome. He can do that all he wants. But when we're in a parking lot where there's cars going really fast, he needs to listen when I say stop. Even though it might feel to him like I'm ruining his fun in the moment or taking away his choice, I'm ultimately keeping him safe, which is more important in that moment. We all face moments where we have a choice to make as to whether we'll give into temptation and take the shortcut. But when we choose God's way, we are choosing to rely on him and not on ourselves, choosing to trust him and his plan over our thoughts and ideas. 
We're choosing to allow his power to work through us, asking him to give us overwhelming victory. So first, we choose God's way and not shortcuts. And secondly, we choose selflessness over personal gain. Look back at the narrative of Jesus and the devil. Remember, his first tactic failed. So the devil tries to mix it up and tempt Jesus in a different way. Then the devil took him into the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up in their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Matthew 4, 5 through 7. This test was different from the first. In this test, Satan made Jesus stand in a high place and he said to him uh, that if Jesus is God's son and the Messiah, nothing will hurt him. In this passage, Satan is telling Jesus that there is a prophecy about the Messiah coming. He reminded Jesus of Psalm 91, 11 through 12, but Satan left out something very important. Verse 9 of Psalm 91, if you make the Lord your refuge. In other words, if you're following him, if you're obeying him, so we are to be living for his gain and his kingdom, not for just ourselves. Our safety and our personal gain are found in doing his will and his plan. And Jesus makes it clear that we're not to test God and expect him to do something that is out of his will. Look at Jesus's words in Mark 8, 36. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? This can be applied to so many situations in our lives, but when we're faced with temptations to choose personal gain, that could be through a lie told. It could make yourself look better at the expense of someone else or making yourself look better for the wrong reasons. It's not God's plan or God's will for your life. And ultimately it will lead you farther from his plan and from his purpose. The reality is we all deal with temptations. Paul writes in first Corinthians, the temptation in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You are not alone in that temptation. Not only do you probably have a community of friends who have experienced something similar, but as a follower of Jesus, you are always equipped with God's spirit within you. We can experience overwhelming victory. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking that you are way too far gone, that you've fallen into temptation far too often, that there's no coming back from it. You're also not alone in that feeling, but that is not God's nature. His overwhelming victory was won long ago for you. I want to take you back to how Paul ends chapter 8 of Romans, starting at 8, 37. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 8, 37 through 39. There is no temptation that is too much for you to overcome. There is no temptation or sin that can keep you from God's love for you. You may have started this message today thinking that there is no way God could have anything but anger toward you, but that's not the case. Instead, he experienced all human temptation so that he could overcome for us. He died on the cross so that all of the eternal consequences for our sin would fall on him, not on you. When you choose Jesus, that's a moment. And we will still face temptations, but when we face those trials, we know that we're connected with Jesus in those moments. This week when you're faced with temptations, however big or small, Take that small moment to declare Jesus's victory as your own. Make it a simple phrase like this. Jesus, thank you for helping me overcome this. I choose your overwhelming victory in this moment.